teaching in, in Buddhism and Zen would be the sati, which is a Sanskrit word, which just means present moment awareness. Yeah. So, so uh, awareness. So oftentimes I'm lost in my head and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just lost in my head and I'm not seeing what's right in front of me. I'm not looking at you and that beautiful dragon behind you. I've got some script that's running through my head. So the practice of sati, manifesting present moment awareness is, is probably the closest analogous thing to, to consciousness. Welcome to the Consciousness of the Way. I am your humble servant and Sifu, Taoist Master San Ching. And I might mix it up a little bit today. Actually, no, e, I lied. It's the same scenario. It's Christmas Day. I come down to the tree and the universe has brought me this incredible being. I want to welcome to the podcast, Shozan Jack Herbner, a Zen master. And Not a Zen a, master, just a Zen priest. A Zen priest, uh, how humble you are, my dear friend. No, no, no. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, I just said that because in, in, in my particular lineage, there's a, a Zen master is somebody who um, got a specific lineage transmission from their teacher. And conspicuously in my tradition, my teacher died without doing that. It left a huge oh. gap in our lineage. So, oh my goodness! I mean, there's no Zen master, so we're all free of that title, and I've since learned to embrace my freedom from it. I, I love that. I love that. Yeah, when, when I uh, enter into the Taoist master, that just comes with being an ordained priest. So that makes it's sense. Sort of part of the course. But I do have like uh, 30, 30 natural born life human year clicks in this space. So. I've definitely gathered uh, some insight outside of the general rituals, which are sort of like uh, handed down from generation to generation, but it's mm -hmm. more the highest point of consciousness or spiritual consciousness, as a dear friend of mine, James Tooney, would say, is really where you create this direct source. So, you know, for, for a Taoist, channeling is the highest point and mm -hmm. ac accessing that and being able to translate that into a 3D reality, so it's self-evident, it's experiential, becomes this visceral sort of like kinesthetic response that you get from feeling as the knowing, not thinking. When you're thinking, you're not knowing. When you're feeling, you are all things. So welcome to the podcast, my dear friend. Um, wow, how about you share with the audience a little bit about yourself leading up to this moment right now? Yeah, I mean, um, I studied philosophy in college. Then when I went to Los Angeles and worked in the film industry uh, for 10 years and got enough of that to satisfy me for a lifetime, fled to the hills outside of Los Angeles where I became a Zen Buddhist monk. So I was a Zen Buddhist monk and a priest for 13 years. I wrote a couple books, uh, Zen Confidential and Single White Monk, um, somewhere in between memoir and maybe auto fiction, more on the memoir side, about my experience as a monk. And then I left that life. Um, in the Zen tradition, you don't stay on the mountaintop forever. You got to come back into the marketplace, as it were. <laughs> So, is, that, is it come down to reality or what? I have no idea. <laughs> just coming off of the cushion and into the podcast space and into Whole Foods or Ralph's Foods or the Highway 10 freeway, or in my case, Vienna. I live in, in Europe now where my, my girlfriend is. Very lives. nice. Yeah. So, so and I've, been, I've got a, a, a YouTube channel where I share um zen talks called zen confidential and i'm working on a novel about artificial intelligence and that's me that's my life right now wow wow that's uh, so so robust and uh it's a the seeker's journey uh, mm, the, student, the teacher the teacher is the student i don't believe there's ever a moment through your your natural born life that some of your life experiences that you're not uh, expanding on this spiritual consciousness realization and so that's such a, a a rich sort of like a narrative let's take a look at that let's take a look at what is the 
what if what did you decipher from that you said you you were a, a zen priest does that mean that you no longer practice or you've just taken a break from the uh, mo monastic sort of like uh, sort of processes of of something with that type of commitment yeah it's an interesting question I mean, it requires a little bit of insider baseball that might be boring, but also maybe not. So I, my teacher came from Japan, uh, from Kyoto, and he set up shop in America under circumstances that were never totally clear to me. Like he was sent here by Myoshinji, which is a big Rinzai lineage uh, branch in Japan, um, but also he was on his own. So he... He and as a Zen master, you can mix it up a little bit. It's not like a cath a Catholic priest where you're under Rome, right? A Rinzai Zen master gets to, in many ways, do his own thing. So that's what my teacher did in California <laughs> with a bunch of hippies back in the '60s and '70s and '80s. He was he was winging it. So he made a lot of priests, and then after a extended period of time, if uh, well, and maybe just I don't know what his standards were, but he made a few of us priests. And before he died, the idea was a priest goes out and starts their own temple. So within my lineage, we had temple transmissions. So when you became a priest, so there's Tokido Shiki, which is monk transmission, Suiji Shiki, which is temple transmission, or priest transmission. So now you can give a certain level of a Dharma talk and teach Zen Buddhism at a certain level. You just can't do koan practice in my tradition as a priest, to give koans, to train people in koans, pass people through the ko a koan curriculum, you have to be a roshi, which is a Zen master. So that's why I, initially I said I wasn't a Zen master. For the audience, uh, sort of expand on the definition of what that means. Me me meaning uh, which, which part of that, which piece? The, the Zen master definition and then to receive or be able to to uh, sort of, you know, hand on that lineage. Yeah. The process and what do you do? What do you gain from that in relation to your own consciousness? Well, you start off uh, uh, at, at the Mount Baldy Zen Center where I practiced. You start off just a student, um, maybe an unsui, which is a, a beginning, a chicken monk. We used to call it that in unsui, there are two characters for the Japanese kanji and it's floating cloud i think in flowing water you're going with the flow you're being blown with the wind you don't assert yourself you follow the schedule right as a chicken monk and you're giving yourself to the practice the schedule and and the teacher and koan practice so so koan practice is important in the rinzai zen lineage because it gives you an opportunity to directly interact with the teacher right it's like a pretext to engage with the teacher. So you're sitting there all day in the meditation hall and you're tired and you're getting yelled at by the by the Jiki Jitsus who are the um, officers in the Zendo who are kind of holding the space in a, in a lively and energetic and slightly perhaps militaristic way, right? And you're, you're getting your ego pushed against and pushed against and pushed against and you're tired and you're protein deprived and you're sleep deprived, right? Then you get to go into Sanzen, koan practice with the teacher and answer your koan. And that's when you're encouraged to no boundaries. That's what I was told when I went when I when I when I, when I was prepared for koan practice. No boundaries whatsoever. So there's the Japanese uh, style of practice is very um, uh, how to put it. It's uh, it, it's a it's a practice, right? You're, you're it's very practical. There's not anything esoteric about it. It's very practical. It's a way to train, right? Um, so then when you go in with the teacher, that's the part of the practice where you can just let it all out and manifest the answer to your koan, right? So um, my teacher did koan training with, with tens of thousands of students for 50 years in America. I mean, he, he, he was um, really unparalleled in his, the number of sanzens that he did with his students. I mean, most, for example, Shoto Harada Roshi is a Zen master in the Rinzai Zen lineage who's training now um, 
And he does, my, a friend of mine does retreats with him. He'll do three koan, uh, koan sessions a week with each student. My, my teacher would do four koan sessions a day with each student during retreat. So he was doing a lot of them. And yet he never led a student fully through the koan curriculum from A to Z. So there's like 1,400, 1,500 koans. And uh, theoretically, you go through all the koans with your teacher. You answer all the koans. Um, there's a, there's koan. a, what, what is a koan? What is oh, a koan? A koan is a, is, a, is, a, is a funny statement that you can't answer with your logical mind. So some of the classical koans might be, or one of, the, one of my favorite classical koans is, what is the sound of one hand? Right. We know the sound of you know two hands. That's the sound of two hands. What's the sound of one hand? Or um, what was your original face before your even your parents were born? I mean, I'm looking at your face right now. You're looking at my face. But what did we look like before our parents were born? What's our original face? So you get this question and immediately. If you're me, your mind is racing in all directions to try and fight to try and solve this one but it's not solvable through logic and reason or poetry or a, a performance art of some kind um so these are primarily to to steal the mind or potentially put you in the center point of all things is it leading that way yeah i think so it's 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 um you know it's it's a it's a tool a shugyo, a spiritual technique to exhaust the rational thinking mind, to exhaust every possible angle that the ego can take on the big picture. And, and when all those options are exhausted and your body's exhausted at a dice session, seven day retreat, um, your patience is exhausted because your teacher keeps laughing at you and when you fail to answer your call correctly, he rings a bell and, and rings you out of the room. Um, when all the other yeah, ego and the body and the mind and all the aspects of the human self are exhausted, sometimes an answer spontaneously rises, it's just spontaneous between you and the teacher. And well, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like a regular day in the 405. <laughs> it can be, I suppose, if you're enlightened on the 405, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's an exhausting exhibition of uh the limitations of the human expression through emotion yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so so it's, you go through i'm sorry go ahead no i was just saying it's 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 yeah it, it's a nice it's a nice it's a very for me it was a very helpful practice because um it allowed me to take a lot of my doubts and a lot of my confusion and all of my scattered mind and my spiritual ambitions and to focus them down into one totally unsolvable question. And that was the koan. So it was a very, it was a good f funnel for my scattered energies. And so with the absence of your, your um, master, so no one got to level up. It's like, hey, uh, I got up to Darth Vader and I heard, you are my son. Right. And, and it was like, there can only be one. Am I confused? Is it Highlander or, or Empire Strikes Back? I'm, I'm a little confused, Dad. It's both. There can only be one and it's the son. It is the son, right? So where does that leave your lineage um, with the absence of a, a transmission or a a, a water bearing sort of like a evidence based um equivalent to the master i mean he he it drops a bomb in the middle of the zendo meditation hall and that's it the lineage is done um so yeah and it's an interesting moment we or maybe just me really expected our teacher to you know, pass the baton forward so that the race could continue. Uh, and nobody can say why that didn't happen. I mean, I have, you know, my friend says, well, nobody got it. Nobody truly got it. 
Well, this is a friend who's now going to a new teacher who is probably the, the most acknowledged, it, actually not probably, the most acknowledged and I would argue significant living Rinzai Zen master who teaches in the West that I'm aware of. And this friend of mine is already being acknowledged within that guy's, uh, with, from that teacher. And he just kind of started with him. So I don't think it's the fact that, that nobody within our tradition got it. But the fact remains that my teacher didn't pass along his, his uh, we call it giving Inca. And you give the papers, you sign Inca papers, and you officially acknowledge somebody as having completed the koan curriculum and, and as being your, your successor. I don't know why he did that, but I'm, I'm in met, at first it was a real problem when I was a full-time monk and I was having to try and lead retreats at the center where my teacher, at the, at the monastery, where my teacher used to train us all, trained you know hundreds of, of priests, hundreds of monks and dozens of priests and tens of thousands of students year after year after year. Everybody from around the world was coming to this temple and suddenly he wasn't teaching anymore because he was sick and there was no, there was no succession plan. And the bottom line is I had to let go of my attachments to this tradition, to this pipeline, to the mojo that was my teacher and that was his particular lineage because because he let it go for whatever reason. And when I left that community, and I'm not in a ton of contact with that community, with that community anymore, when I left that community, um, I, I realized what a gift it was that he didn't shackle any of us to his, um, to his lineage or to a successor because we're free. We're free. We don't have his name to cling to. We don't have his spiritual bloodline pump into our veins. You know, we're free. And and what we learned with him and what we learned on the cushion, that's the only thing we have. And and so it's it's true freedom. That's how I take it. Is it a uh, um, is there's a sense of disappointment, perhaps? Maybe there was, but now not so much. Now, like I said, I feel I feel. I feel freed. I don't. I, I don't think I could get on YouTube and talk the way I do and offer the kind of teachings I do if he had a successor. I think probably at some point I would be asked to turn in my robes because I'm a bit unhinged. You know, I'm saying what I want to say and how I want to say it when I want to say it, um, and I am not. I don't have a, a temple, and I'm not doing the traditional ceremonies that a Rinzai priest does, the Hanamatsuri ceremony or the Buddha's birthday ceremony, um, et cetera. So um, I, I feel pretty good about not, not uh, about what, how my teacher left things for better or worse. I, mean, yeah. that's the yeah. thing about I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a really expansive moment. It's kind of like that scene in Rocky. Adrian! <laughs> and just reaching out for more. I just There's, watched that movie. I just watched that movie. What an interesting coincidence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so within your practices and the methods that you train people in, so for, for example, what I do is I train people deep in the alchemy. I get their energetics really clear, um, get them up and running, clairvoyance, mediumship channeling, healing, all that kind of stuff is within the infrastructure of what I teach my students. And they get real world results pretty quickly they're off to the races what do you generally um structure your sort of teaching in is it more getting into that state of consciousness um looking to develop specific skills are there certain methods that you would share or um give us a little little sampling of what what the structure looks like yeah, I mean, my, my teacher used to say that Zen has few moving parts. So it's, it's a very simple practice. Uh, so there were two major, actually, there was one major piece of the practice for me, and that was uh, Zazen, which was sitting meditation. Uh, but I quickly learned that actually, Zaz, there's nothing special about Zazen. Uh, it's just a, a manifestation of, of, I guess you could maybe call it oneness practice, or my teacher would call it making relationship. 
So when we would go to the Zendo meditation hall, we would sit, right? And I mean, we were in there for a long period of time. The sits were 25 minutes long, but they were broke and they were broken up with a 10 minute walking meditation sometimes, but hour upon hour upon hour, week after month after year, sitting in the Zendo. And, and what are you doing when you're sitting in the Zendo? Well, first your mind is going nuts. It's freaking out because it doesn't <laughs> like to be in one spot doing nothing. It's like a it's like a crazy squirrel and you've enclosed it in a tinier, tinier, tinier space and it's beating against the walls and it's freaking out, right? So the mind freaks out. But the practice is to take your attention and bring it to the body, bring it to the breath, you need to bring it to the inside and notice the freak out, the thoughts, the emotions, the storyline, the red hot feeling. Just notice it. And, and, and I was taught, don't indulge it. Don't run away with fantasies. Don't repress it. Don't try and just let it come up. Leave it alone. Let it come up. Do what it has to do. And as best you can, just note and then let it go. And then give yourself back to the breath. So give yourself completely to the exhale and completely to the inhale. Such a simple practice. And, and what I like about the Zen style of meditation that I learned, which is called Zazen or Shikantaza, it's proactive. So you're giving your attention completely to that exhale. And it's not a mental thing, even not necessarily a physical thing. It's just a kind of a, the word Zen means single pointed concentration. You're bringing your concentration, focused attention down to one point into the breath. And at some point you're going to lose yourself. Like I'm telling you, like you sit there for on the cushion day after day during a retreat for 18 hours a day and you're upset. And then you have fa spiritual fantasies and then you write a novel and then you solve all your problems with your parents and your girlfriend. And finally, at some point, there's nothing left to do but the practice. And, and maybe you have a few moments where you're exhaling completely and your inner world is coming out with the breath and you're giving yourself completely to the cosmos. And it's, it, and it's, it's an experience. It's not what I just said. <laughs> and, then you're, and then that activity comes to an end. And there's a point where there's no exhale and no inhale. They've dissolved into each other. And then the inhale happens naturally and you're inhaling the universe. And maybe at one point during the day, you hear the call of a bird outside and it's so clear and there's no separation between you and the bird. And, 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 then, you, and then you do your practice all over again and try to get to that point. And, and, and just a simple, and, and then, so then, so then that's what, so that's Zazen practice, but every aspect of life at a Zen monastery is that same principle. You're in the kitchen as a, as a Tenzo, which is a, which is a cooking monk. You're cooking for everybody. It's the same practice. You know, your mind is going crazy. You're thinking about the food. You're thinking about calories. Are you getting people their protein? Is there too much oil in this dish? Is there, is the soup too watery? The practice is, you're in the activity of chopping the carrots. And if you do that activity of chopping the carrots, which with as much focus and intention and single pointed concentration as you did your exhale in the meditation hall, then you can dissolve the ego and the self completely in that activity of chopping the carrots. And it's the same thing, right? Maybe you have that moment when you and the carrot are one, like there's no separation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in Taoism, we call it the now. Actually, we call it Wuji. It's a Wuji, okay. The center point between the breath in and the breath out, between yin and yang, is uh, the center point. The okay. stillness, which is the mother, the mother of all things, the Tao. Oh, and so okay. to obtain that uh, state, it starts with an energy, has a vibration, a frequency, and then you obtain the resonance, and it will be yours. Oh, yes, it will. Yeah. And so when you stay there, that resonance is representative of this um, primordial realization that is 
an expression of, of embryonic breathing, which is what you sort of lean towards within a Taoist practice where you're now the respiration of consciousness. You are mm -hmm. no longer using the physicality, which is a sort of like a materialized, materialistic version of the universe as everything is representative as a micro from a macro, all is one, one is all. And when you're doing that, you can operate simultaneously multi-layered consciousness in every dimension at once. And that comes from the Ni, Ni Dan practice, the internal alchemy practice. So when we get into the internal alchemy practice, it's very palpable. You're moving. The energy is quite clear. You're able to generate results in every dimension right now. Yeah. The present moment is how you access that. And that is a resonance that is second to none. And when you're there, things that would be a little bit delayed due to this density, and most people tend to get separated because they start talking about the 3D reality. Well, you have to be a fourth dimensional being to realize there is a three dimensional reality. So you're already there. And from that is sort of a hop, skip and a jump, jump to a, a fifth dimensional realized all things. That means everything right now. And it's only self-evident in an experiential moment mm. that is visceral. So mm. when you're thinking, you're not knowing. When you're knowing, you're feeling. Mm. And that will be self-evident. And I, I generally measure that when I get people into that resonance. And they're always in a 40 hertz and above sort of state mm. of awareness, which is a complete engulfing of the brain, accessing the uh, alpha, data, the theta, um, epsilon state at the same time, meaning that you can erase, reprogram, change the course of your reality right now, and you are consciousness. That means your consciousness is the default. So as my dear friend James Tooney would say, spiritual consciousness, because consciousness in it itself is starting to get become a little dirty, mm -hmm. and these, uh, a lot of these uh, sci scientists sort of like base um, uh, are attempting to separate yourself from all things by calling mm -hmm. it a conscious agency, which mm -hmm. is a little problematic in of itself when they mm -hmm. start peppering those words, taking you further and further away from true source, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And so that becomes evident in the, the energetic uh, uh, properties mm -hmm. as you start to realize from the physicality within a Taoist, you start at matter, chi, shen, being Shen spirit, Wuji, the stillness, and then of course the mother of all things Tao, and then you replicate those very five properties, and you do it again for another four times, leading you to the ninth highest level of expression, which is the highest point within Taoism, and then you reverse the numbers. So then mm -hmm. you're going from eighty-one in a nine-point level all the way down to nine and then you go back up again so the mirroring effect of that is right from this incantation that the jade emperor teaches all people and i teach it as a vessel of his transmission a power abundant in its giving you will receive unifying the body with the spirit the spirit with the energy bringing heaven to earth transcending all is one one is all revealing perfection manifest that is your gift that is your offering. That is your gift. That is your offering. That is your gift. That is your offering. And that resonance that you're feeling, that that chill, that charge you're getting up your spine is representative of that. It's a visceral thing. This is what takes place. But this is a clairvoyant sense that I train people in because I see it first and then I feel the, the energetic charge that you're experiencing. This is just a, a repeatable developmental skill that comes with being now being this present moment mm. and uh you know it's it's important to validate that from a very low level materialistic point of the expression of your what i think you referred to ego state we just call it personality mm -hmm. that is just the construct of the sum of your life experiences and then you level up very quickly because that polarizing effect of that resonance will then just filter out the what my dear friend, one of my friends, a Buddhist monk, would call the dukkha, the distortion. 
that comes within that. And he he spends, you know, I don't I don't like the energetic stuff. It makes me feel weird. I just like to be still. I'm like, you you do you, Martin, whatever you want, brother. It's like I just want to observe. Mm-hmm. And every time it comes in, I'm watching it and I'm not allowing it to possess me because that's really what happens. I mean, the the distraction is the emotional state. The idea that that's actually a true expression of you, the identity that's looking back at you in the mirror, is uh, false. <laughs> and you come through that realization, you know. So that's kind of like where we're at on the alchemical processes. Uh, you know, a lot of the alchemical stuff that I just had an, al- a, a, an alchemist on just yesterday. And he goes right down to the material level stuff. And it's very powerful when you're imprinting this stuff because you're accessing a frequency, a resonance that is beyond this electromagnetic spectrum. So, you know, Chi, Tao, Buddha, God, universe is not from this dimension. And it's quite Mm -hmm. self-evident because it will alter what would seem an impossible task in this 3D reality instantaneously. But you have to resonate there. You have to be able to be the tuning fork that brings that what we have altered with our own attention intention. We've altered this layered state. Mm -hmm. Everything is a distortion because it's come from the same cloth, perfection. And we've distorted it due Mm -hmm. to our lens of perception. Mm -hmm. And so you bring in perfection and you reset things and bring them back to the default of that conscious awareness, that spiritual conscious awareness as the present moment, no place, person, or thing, you are just now, superhuman stuff happens mm-hmm. in the next minute. Adrian! <laughs> it's on, man. It's on. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you well, know, I... It was over my head, but uh, it, it, it rings in my ears in a nice way. Thank you. Well, well, it's it's a, a visceral thing. You don't. That's the point of knowing. Jade Emperor always says, "If you have to learn it, you don't know it. If you mm. know it, you don't have to learn it." Yeah, that sounds good. Your whole experience, right? Your whole experience of your exploration is a visceral thing. You know, it it comes to that point where I just I'm expanding. That charge yeah. you get through your legs, through your body, you're expanding. That's a that's it. Right. And so you just know you don't have to go down to the the nitty gritty of what does this really mean. It it's here. Mm. That's that's the truth to all things, in my opinion, and, mm-hmm. and what I've I've observed and what I've realized through my own journey, mm-hmm. and you know, leveling up um, in this lifetime over the last thirty years uh, as a priest. It's sort of like interesting. But it's profound because the alchemical process is really, in my opinion, very fulfilling and bringing you back to uh, the complete wholeness, that moment um, where you're not distracted by your personality. And I never recommend anyone virtue signaling by attempting to erase it. Listen, I like... uh, uh, chocolate bonbons, uh, Netflix, and rather driving my side-by-side in the desert at 100 miles an hour. That mm. has nothing to do with bringing, bringing this present moment. Mm. Yeah. What do you think yes. that? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, my teacher used to say, um, which I appreciated when I was first starting out, is that, uh, you know, the self always manifests. You, you, you have a moment of, of dissolution, if you will, where you're, ego is is gone or you're not thinking about yourself you're not thinking about anything like that moment in the zendo i was talking about earlier where you just where there's just the the sound of the chipmunk and there's just this clarity but the outside world is on the inside and, and your inside world is all the way on the outside and that sounds a little bit esoteric but it's but but everybody has that experience where they're one with nature or they see a sunset and it blows them away and they're not thinking they, their problem that they had a moment earlier is literally dead and blown away and incinerated, evaporated, gone, right? Because they round up a corner and they see this beautiful sunset, right? That could be a, um, an experience of oneness. Uh, but, and you're not thinking. You're just completely connected to 
the outside world, to the activity of seeing, to the sunset, however you want to put it, right? But then the self arises again. And then you're thinking about it in a nanosecond later, right? You're, you're thinking about how beautiful it is. And you're wishing you had your camera so you could photograph it and put it on Instagram without a filter. <laughs> you're, then the, the thinking mind starts up again and the self reasserts itself and 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 that's life right and you have your wants and your needs and your personality and your flavor and that's what makes life beautiful on some level right i mean our our flaws our quirks right right i mean you know you start to really get into the deep nature of that um the the grade of difference from the energetic properties because everything's energy frequency vibration that when you are like this moment um within the teaching i share with people you're able to observe at all times you're no mm -hmm. longer in the narrative and and it's very easy to do because it's energetically palpable and you're shifting these gears so what happens is for example you mentioned oh yeah and then you get back into the thinking when you get to that default state where you're 100 percent consciousness latsu one of my teachers i channeled 30 years ago and is with me in 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 conference on a day-to-day -day basis minute by minute he's my teacher at all times he always starts with concept consciousness knowing unconscious knowing then being one with all mm. so that becomes now and so when you when you activate these very powerful energy centers that people tend to dismiss in many ways mm. a lot of people don't really focus their attention or make it present their energetic practices it's sort mm. of like oh i you know it's not part of my my process right. and I'll tell people that it, if you start harnessing and synchronizing these energy centers and mm. become aware that this present moment accesses that crazy things happen so for example when you said oh and then you start to think and well what happens when you are default consciousness spiritual consciousness to james it dissolves so you cannot do you cannot create the dukkha so your mind may go there and it will just literally as if someone lights it with a match and it burns up mm. and that's a very powerful state to be in so there's literally a void it's darkness until of course your thoughts all thoughts of your mind are not yours so now you need to discern and affirm a very clear path of how that information is being received as your personality or as this present moment and mm. when you get the default there's an energetic palpability that you cultivate to stay there and so you can switch in and out of it at will. So you said there's everything is energy, frequency, and vibration, mm -hmm. and that's and that's kind of like a core teaching for you as a Taoist. Mm -hmm. yep. And then and then and then are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you oh, see sorry. me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I haven't gone anywhere. I just yeah. like Adobe um, just sent me an update, like, and, and you yeah, disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Why did you disappear? <laughs> okay, uh, energy, frequency, and vibration, yeah. and and that's sort of a core teaching in your in your lineage and for mm -hmm. you. And then you off of that, you're you're manifesting certain practices. Is that right? Or or one oh, practice okay. cultivating to a point of the default. The side effect is. We have many different rituals that are a deep architecture of, of what someone would perceive as a manifestation and, and activating and working in the spirit realms and everything above that is mm. absolutely part of the processes and very much an important now moment is realizing yeah. that that is very, very tangible and is the present moment and we are operating that. It's just you've been separated so far from remembering who you are the first thing first and foremost is to remember who you are mm -hmm. is to remember that you are this present moment and to remember is to know and you said you said the mother in Taoism is the now is that what you said yeah the mother is all things the mother yeah. is everything mm -hmm. so you know 
we have rituals where we use certain scepters that are not just shaped in, they are the shape and the the actual axis of the uterus, which is the center point. Mm. And so there are no coincidences that it takes nine months to mm. completely create and deliver a human life form, which is when the soul enters that from a concept pers- uh, position is really reference to what some scientists would call the Big Bang, with all pun aside, this is the creation of all things. And so we always use that as the highest point. Nine is the highest point. And you go, holy crap, that makes a lot of sense to me. Absolutely. And then you reverse it. So when we go up to 81, which is a very significant um, number, we will reverse that 81 and turn that into an 18 and then go back down. So the 81 will be 18, the 72 will be 27, and so on and so forth, down to that last point, which is the center point, the Wuji. So it's a mirroring effect, unifying, as as I said within that incantation, unifying the body with the spirit, the spirit with the energy. So you do, so you have a scepter, um, and you said it's, it's almost shaped like a womb, or it is that the manifestation. Yeah, it is. Yeah, then yeah. you do a ceremony with it, incantations. Like, how does that work? Like, what, what, what? Literally. Well, how does it work? It depends on what you're doing. Like, I mean, I'll give you an example of um, drive-by um, magic. Right? You want to get <laughs> into magic? Um, <laughs> driving down the highway with my family, and um, I get pulled over by a cop because I was going ten miles over. Okay. And I instantly read the resonance of that cop, highly anxious, highly fidgety, fearful, many different things. So I pull over, him and his his uh, sidekick mm. approach the car with a very, um, um, you know, defensive sort of uh, position, hand mm. on his gun, the whole thing, mm. reading, his thought, reading his thought forms, wind down the windows. Okay, wind down the windows. Now, a very deep understanding when you're at a state, when, when I work in a multidimensional state, from, a, from an observer, you would assume I've just fed my personality and I'm dead in the water and there's no possible way that I could manifest my way out of a confrontation. And in, in, in the end, serving my emotions, the result is you have generated what some people would call a karmic event and it's a representation of what you put out, you get back. Okay. So that resonance that I put out is a 24-7 sort of like uh, production line. I don't okay. leave that resonance, yet I can still entertain my personality at will without leaving that resonance. Now, at face value, someone would say, oh, well, you're just fitting your personality. When the officer approached, said, wind the windows down, my first, because at my personality while still working on that resonance and i've already created a manifestation before he even got out of the car he walks towards it my personality is not having it and i asked him that question is there any reason why there's thoughts in your mind that you want to draw your firearm on my family and he was just like give me your license of registration i'm writing you a ticket you're 10 miles over Mm. now part of my personally my my mission or things that drive me is to raise the collective consciousness. Mm. So I already imprinted that before he got out of the car. To the amazement of of my wife, but she already knows this, she knows how I operate. If someone was watching this, he returned, what's the expectation? A ticket, make sure you don't do it again, here's a fine, be on your way. Mm. He returned with, here's your license and registration, You've got a beautiful family. Mm. Make sure you don't do it again. I'm giving you a warning. Mm, With a smile on his face. Mm. Now, you're shifting the energetic potential within his energetic body, which is basically a reflection of his physical state. Emotions are a, a, a representation of the resonance of the planets because you are a micro of a macro. Mm. The universe is you. All is one. One is all. So when you alter that state and you bring in that resonance, things are affected instantaneously. What were were the words that you said to him again? So he, so he rolled, you rolled down the window and he, he, and and I said, is there any reason why you have the thoughts of drawing your firearm on my family? 
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Great. Well, because I'm just reading his thought forms, which yeah, is part yeah. of the clear yeah. uh, development yeah. that I teach people. But yeah. moreover, he's already he's already he's already been anchored with mm -hmm. another energetic program that I put out before he ever got out of the car. Mm. So you 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 have to understand when you're that present moment, you're operating in all dimensions at once. Mm. And so at face value, most people will be unraveled. Potentially, you might go down the route of your personality and uh, it's not going to end well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an example of how quickly you can manifest this very moment. Mm. Or moreover, something a little bit more wow factor supernatural i'll envelop my forearm in anesthesia run a skewer through it pull it out you won't have an exit or entry point and no blood and you'll go what did i just witness because it's a state of consciousness and that's kind of part of the cultivational practices because within taoism we saturate the human body mortality is part of the programming mortality is basically taking this physical vehicle to its maximum potential in this incarnation. And so you want to have charge of the 50 trillion cells that you possess, and you want to access that 0 0.7 millivolts of electricity in every cell. And when you start harnessing that, the potential is unlimited. And you level up your constitution, and you start to understand that you never have to use your life force most, uh, most of the people that come to me are light workers, healers, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, uh, you know, people that are in service with the attempt, medical doctors, Chinese medicine doctors, acupuncturists, they all have this intention, I want to help mankind. And throughout their career, they get burnt out where they just hate people because there's not enough money in the world that will cushion their response to the very limited things that they're doing. Because they're they're literally selling their soul in that very cliche throwaway, but in actuality they're they're restricting their life force mm -hmm. when they put their attention intention to helping someone become whole again. However, their practices because they haven't learned the energetics. The energetics are critical. Understand so you, never have to you, act with that. When you say learn the energetics, because because that because that, that seems like an important piece to what you do. What so what? So in, sort of in a nutshell, what do you mean by that? I'm curious. Um, develop the internal alchemy. Develop the dantians. We call them dantians. They're called energy fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've now, heard that. We have three major ones. And you you are able to basically store and energize these, these dantians with information. This upper dantian is representative of the sun, and it accesses all the light. Middle dantian is representative of the earth. It accesses all the information. Lower Dantian is representative of the moon, and it accesses all the energy. Now, the alchemical process is being able to separate electric from magnetic and then dip into the magnetic fluidity, which is pure yin, to do things that are more commonly developed, like yin eyes, which is the gateway to all clairvoyance and an intuitive awareness. And these are developmental skills that you take part in your own path as a Taoist seeker, uh, a disciple, student, however your your path is within the exploration of the mother. Right. And so these are all, the methods are important because a humanist, someone who experiences the representation of being a human being subject to their human condition, there is a programming. It's called a heteroaction for all psychologists, psychiatrists, people that want to get deep into the mind, which is very limited, what you start, you must finish. It's a natural instinct of survival within a human's uh, uh, programming. So when I reach my hand out, your natural instinct is to return it as a mirroring effect. This is part of what happens. And when you do that, you have just lost any sense of free will. Hmm. Free will is determined by your consciousness. So when you become emotional, whether your eyes are open or closed, you're unconscious 100%. That means you're suggestible. That means that everything and anything is possible for that potential hijacking of your sense of knowing. So, you know, one of the first things uh, that are sort of ground level, sort of infantile stuff 
is I taught most of my kids, I have six kids, five of them know how to hypnotize people, do remote viewing, healing, all that kind of crazy clairvoyant stuff because they're open to, to any possibility. My eldest still believes in Santa Claus. I have not removed that sense of knowing because he can tap into the energetic potential, which is very palpable. And if you want to suggest that it's not, wait until the month of December and watch the resonance of the earth change significantly. And if you monitor and observe what they call the Schumann resonance, you will see the change of what kind of hertz frequency the earth is from the magnetic field is transmitting, and it's evident in the experience. And so all these things can be related, but the most important thing is the self-evidence, is the experiential now moment. And that comes from developing the skills and being able to show people, not just this sort of like half, sort of half-hearted talking head that's all in words. Yeah, you know, uh, you can do this, you can do that. I'm a show me guy. I'll do the, I'll take the Pepsi challenge with anyone on that stuff. Mm. It's like, uh, yes, I've shown myself I'm an 80s guy. I really love the 80s. This is part of my personality. It has nothing to do with with what I can express as this present moment. Yet, yeah. most people get caught up in identity, and the yeah. identity is the trap. Especially these days, right? The identity is so powerful in culture, society, politics. It's really the. It's really the. Yeah, it's the geist, the geist, the spirit of the moment. At least in America, and and maybe Western Europe as well, where I live. Yeah. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure whether I answered it or not. It did. It did. It answered it and it raised a few. <laughs> it's what? interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very, very, very rich. It's um, yeah, I don't know that much about Taoism, so it's nice, nice hearing hearing you talk about oh, it. Oh yeah, because I mean basically the 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 timeline of history of Chinese culture as you know it started with the seed of the connection with the yellow emperor in the universe. Um, uh, uh, on a timeline that has been documented back to 6000 BC. Again, it, it goes way beyond that. Yellow Emperor is one of my teachers. I, I go into conference with him on a daily basis. There's an extent of the information and the connection with the Taoist infinity with the universe is completely uh, skewed and distorted by this very limited timeline because anything that comes out of um, quite frankly, China is a lie, and none of it is really tangible with what is documented. So the seed of that started, if you were going to go by the timeline that is is obvious, 6000 BC with pictographs and oracle bone reading, and then it transmutes into the, the gradient variable uh, of what we represent as Mandarin today within Chinese culture or that's simplified or traditional Mandarin, uh, traditional Chinese, which would be Cantonese. And then there's variables of that dialect over each emperor's, you know, residency. And so within that, each emperor had his Taoist advisor because mm -hmm. we are the magic men. Mm -hmm. We are deep alchemy. We're all magic. We're all into it. And we practice it. We're doers. As mm -hmm. Yoda would say, there is no try, only do. And that's what the Taoists were into. And that's what they specialized in. And they still to this day, unfortunately, over the last hundred years, there's been megalomaniacs that have performed forms of genocide on mankind, i.e. the Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And that was evident um, by certain dictators that I will remain nameless that have eradicated the very essence of Taoism off the face of the earth. And quite frankly, over time, Probably about the third emperor, they got on to, hang on a second, we can't have free thinkers. This Taoism stuff's mm -hmm. a little too distorted for our liking, the idea that someone could empower themselves. So there was a, a conscious effort to blend Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so with that, there was a very confused state of mind. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what's what, what's up, what's down, because if you get a clear path of cultivation, you will be free. Oh, yes, you will. And that's a problem. And so mm -hmm. forever since then, there's been a very, Taoism is, is, is probably well known to be very secretive and quite 
um, fragmented any offerings of any eternal alchemy. I've yet to see one in, in the Western world that is legitimate outside of the stuff I teach. And that's okay. You know, people find me. That's why I got to social media about a year ago and I'm progressively moving through. My teachers have set the framework of how that is going to arise. And then the realization of leveling up consciousness, spiritual consciousness to the world is momentary. It will be soon. And the more people, the more I expose people to the material, the more they realize, holy crap, this is real. This, this, the, the idea that you have a clear path and a method of cultivation that has been around for thousands of years, you're literally hopping on. Imagine you're driving down the highway on a wet day and you stay in the, in the groove of the car in front of you because you don't want to be subject to the oil slick that was just recently revealed after the transition from hot to cold. This is what you do when you fall into the groove of a Taoist practice. It's been validated for generations, for thousands of years, and it's self-evident in the cultivation practices where you will be able to realize your emotions don't control you, you control your emotions. And that is nothing more than a side effect of the human condition, which is not a bad thing. But when you start to understand the deception of the separation from your true self as the now, you start to be able to quite confidently manifest and develop these skills because the energetic potential is palpable. When you develop the internal alchemy practices, it's like this. It's, it's We ain't playing. And you can call on that at will, as you should. And anything that you put your time and attention into should be measurable. If mm. I give someone a 27-minute practice, which consists of a nine-point transition and an experience, in the end of that 27 minutes, they will be able to go out and use it in what we call the real world. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, oh, I'm in that state of bliss and I'm just chill and I got out of my state of bliss and someone told me to go F myself for the next door neighbor said, get your dog off my lawn, it's crapping. And then you embody your personality and go straight back from where you were escaping. And mm -hmm. it shouldn't be an escape plan. It should be a realization of remembering who you are. And when that happens, you can literally test it because there's an entrainment that takes place within this alchemical process where you can go out from your first, the first experience that I ever share with you, and you can measure the, the effects on your nervous system instantaneously with an exercise I give you. So you're like, hang on a second. I spent 27 minutes. I should be able to measure this. Absolutely, 100%. I, I don't, out of, out of judge, I've got a personality. So I do say, hey, go ahead. After you finish this first time, go out and create a confrontation and see how quickly you can harness your awareness that you have complete control of your emotional state. And people freak out, you know. A lot of people that use the material I teach them are uh, attorneys, doctors, uh, accountants, mm -hmm. and they're not on the spiritual path like you and I. They just want to get a level up. They just want to have a life that's not distorted from the dukkha, which is the human condition, and they're getting distracted from that because they're, they're like a runaway train because they were taught that there is no solution, there is no possibility that you could potentially have charge of this very moment, the present now, and that charge you're getting right now. It's like it's resonating with you. Whatever I'm saying is having a fundamental, what you would say, positive effect of curiosity, interest, you're definitely holy moly. This this sounds pretty cool. I don't know. It, it could have potential because it, it, embodying and empowering yourself and knowing who, who you are should be the self-evident um, moment of consciousness for everybody. We're all, we're all designed the same way. I, I tell people, people are like, the first time they experience uh, any sort of training from me, it feels like the first side effect, five, five pina coladas, a full body massage in 10 days in the Bahamas. And they're like, how the hell did that happen? I didn't have a spiritual thought in my body. I'm not any type of religious person, but I am high as a kite. And it's all the neurology. You understand that you start to realize that this is part of the tuning fork. 
And then from there, you start to level up and the palpability of those tangible grades of difference get you into a conscious state of now. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. Yeah. I like that last part, the conscious state of now. <laughs> a lot of your um, stem winders come back to that basic principle. Which oh, yeah. Much, yeah. yeah. When you look yeah. at the Tao Te Ching, I just transcribed the 2024 version with uh, Latsu. And it's really potent because the Tao Te Ching to a Taoist um, that's part of understanding the cultivation of the, the true purpose of the Tao Te Ching, it is a magical register. And mm. people are like, what the hell is that? Each verse is an, an incantation. Each mm. incantation mm. has gradients and levels of consciousness that you level up in as you're, you're speaking it, singing it, audibly, inaudibly, and ultimately there's a frequency that goes with that. And so when you engage with the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching that was translated directly from Latsu through me as a catalyst, it's palpable. You you read the first verse and you're like, you're, you're, you're vibrating and going, what the heck is going on here? I, I, because it's in, in, integrated deep within the core of who you are. And I mean, you can start looking at the lens of other languages that are far more um, fresh and sort of new aged, like science or quantum physics, understanding that, that that moment is now. And on a deeper level, the things that, that compel you are deep within your, your, your true essence. And it just so happens a representation of that is not just the flesh and blood, but the DNA. And within the DNA, it's quite evident that words, numbers, symbols, letters dictate and control your very action. And when you understand that, you get to the center point, which is between the breath in and the breath out within a, a brain scan. It's right in the center point of the intellect and the uh, uh, intuitive. And that center point is right here. Now, what a coincidence it happens to be what some people might consider the third eye. Um, for a Taoist, we're activating what we call the sacred infinite flower, and it evokes the Ru Yi, and that starts oscillating. And all of a sudden, everything becomes revealed. You open up the 81 chambers of the upper Dantian, and all bets are off. The Shen Dan, or more Shen Gong, is the power of the spirit will be realized and holy moly, you're off to the races and uh, Harry Potter ain't got nothing on you. And that's how it should be. It should be an exploration. And, uh, you know, a product of your environment, i.e. the now moment, will be self-evident. Will be what? It'll be self-evident. You, mm. you will experience and know it. And you, 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 you should be very aware when someone gives you an absolute anything. From a Taoist perspective, everything is possible. That means there are no limitations. That means that if you are truly a micro of a macro, all is one, one is all. That means everything is abundant, timeless, endless, limitless, infinite. There are no exceptions. So the, the physical materialistic uh, representation of that is also has the same potential, but it will be killed in what you perceive as the mental as the psyche, you will kill that. You will give yourself a programming that will limit the very existence of this physicality and it will have a timeline that you have crafted, you have created, you have manifested due to what you are perceiving and what you're receiving and what you're accepting. And your knowing will be self-evident. Your experience, where you go with that, whether your timeline is five minutes, five lifetimes, it's up to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you wind up in Vegas? Um, this is where all the sacred uh, natural form pyramids are. And how how so? Pardon me? How so? Oh, they're out in the desert. They're everywhere. One of the, one of the skills that I teach people is called body dowsing, which is an ancient Taoist uh, technique. I heard of that. What, what's the gist of it? Well, basically, you're a tuning fork. So from a from a psychologist, hypnotherapist uh, perspective, you would call this idiomotor response or more commonly uh, divination. 
So divination transmission comes in the form of all things. You are the tuning fork. So you can measure your unconscious. Some people might tweak uh, muscle testing, uh, in cam oh, sorry, uh, Ouija boards, tarot cards, dowsing tools, uh, pendulums. They're all representation of this divination transmission. Now, how do you validate that is you create a clear sense of vision your yin eyes are activated so you can see the energetic properties as well as feel them. So you find through body dowsing, you find the ley lines, the power centers, the water seas that are around you everywhere. And so I like getting people that are with their eyes open, showing them all the water seas in their home. And they're like, holy crap, I'm not in the lotus position, lighting three incense, calling in my guides singing Kumbaya, I'm feeling the properties of that right now. And then a lot of people that are in their humanness will be like, ah, oh, well, I was with San Ching and he was probably hypnotized me or something. And then they wake up the next day and they go right back to the vortices and go, holy shit, it's right here. It's actually still here. I wasn't in any sort of state where I was communicating with him and the properties are there because you tune someone's energetic potential. I will say I do that. I tune your energetic potential that perhaps maybe you may not be aware of, but that's very quick. It's not the old Mr. Miyagi. Mm. You've got to do that. You're you're mm. literally you're you're on a path where you've got to convince yourself that's present. When I tune your energetic potential, you will feel the palpability of energy instantaneously without having to take a processes that is dumbed down to a materialist sort of like viewpoint. The energy will be evident instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And then you can use that as a, as a skill, as you should, because, I mean, this is the ancient techniques that in the OG days, you wouldn't put a place of worship, a temple, a church, or anything, unless you found the highest resonance of that ascended point within between you, the universe, Buddha, God, Tao. That was the whole point of finding these spaces. And so I take people out when they do retreats or training with me and we go out to the, the desert and the natural form pyramids. And, you know, quite frankly, at a certain point from my own training, my teachers are like, oh, yeah, we need to go over the, 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 the geometry, the shapes. We need to go deep on it. I'm like, listen, last time I checked, the Hollywood version of the stuff you've shared with me had nothing to do with geometry and certainly had nothing to do with pyramids that's an Egyptian thing, isn't it? And they're like, no. Take a closer look. They're, they are shared across the Chinese landscape. There are hundreds of them. And we chop the tops off because that high point of, of ascension, where normally someone would put things that are, are crystalline in their nature, the most purest uh, resonating point through a material item that may, may be a metal or a, a crystal form, we use that to lay down the grid work for star stepping. And we we tune the constellations, which are really a mirror of the pyramids. And so you bring in that energy. And, you know, I, I might cheat a little bit. I'm a little bit more advanced than the average bear. And so you start with the practices, the rituals. You build up the palpability of that culture, that cultivating practice. And then the the duration of time that it takes you to stay in that moment, that present moment, becomes instantaneous. And that's where you start realizing you're operating in all dimensions at once and you kind of do the type of stuff I was just talking about 10 or 15 minutes ago. It's interesting. So Taoism is the Taoism you practice. It's, a, it's kind of a magic practice, basically. Well, yeah, well, that's the very essence of, of mm. uh, any sort of belief system has a very deep sort of esoteric, mystical realization. Because Taoism was the seed of it was from channeling. It, you know, if you if if people really think someone as a, as a representation of man sat down and went, I've got a good idea. Here's a methodology. Here's a belief system. They received it from a higher state. Mm -hmm. They were getting that information from somewhere, and mm -hmm. it wasn't coming from their mind. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, the Tao Te Ching is such a profound, profound text, and I return to it again and again and again. And it is sort of gnomic um, piece, one piece of wisdom, the next piece of wisdom, like you said, almost an incantation. What was, do we know anything? I'm, I'm really ignorant when it comes to Taoism, just, just yeah, yeah. what I've been able to use. Do we know anything about Lao Tzu? Like, do we know? Yeah. I mean, I've got a whole, I'm just finishing up a, an immortal catalog where I sit in conference and interview all the immortals. Lutsu mm -hmm. has a really profound story. And actually, when if you ever go to the transcript, transcribed Tao Te Ching that I just released, you can find it across my social media if you're looking for it, it will rock your world because it, it's what we call a living scripture, as all scriptures are, really. But it, 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 as you notioned, as you mentioned, it has a riveting visceral effect. And so within Lutsu, through his own mention, through his own story, it started as a young boy when he was trapped within a, 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 a sort of like um, a, a rock at the base of, of a river near his town that he lived in, and he broke his ankle, and he dragged himself to the side of the river base. And in that same moment, he was able to think and realize and fuse his bone in that same thing. And from that, it blossomed into fusing his ankle, bringing it back to its original state, no pain, no suffering, nothing. And then he was given a reputation of being the boy who can show you how to remember. And from there, it, it blossomed into a much bigger uh, um, reputation that he held close to himself. And in essence, the fragmented stories of his life ended with some dusty old guy on an ox, you know, strolling outside of the, uh, the the province that he lived in, crossing the border into another country, never to be seen again, which a lot of that is absolute nonsense from his own spoken word. And I take that at face value because it's it has a resonance to it. When you read it, you'll be like, holy crap, this is real because I can feel it. And it goes way beyond um, whether you have to validate it with some historical reference, which is very vague and ambiguous and yeah. it doesn't meaning. That's why you're like, there's really not much for the doubt. No, there isn't. But yeah. I'm changing that. I'm yeah. changing that because I'm bringing that information in. And by what having, years was he writing in? What when was that? Well, from from a timeline that is on paper, we're talking like you know one thousand. 1300 BC around that nation. Now, mm -hmm. he was mentoring the Yellow Emperor. The Jade Emperor was mentoring the Yellow Emperor. And that was acknowledgement in on a timeline of 6000 BC. Mm -hmm. From their own spoken word, it goes hundreds of thousands of years before that because they're a transmutation of what we call within Taoism the diamond, another facet. So even though there was an acknowledgement of the Yellow Emperor's presence, where he rode a celestial dragon from, from the universe down to planet Earth and then was magnetized to the Earth for 18 days and nights and downloaded everything that you know was Chinese culture today, including Chinese medicine, internal alchemy, the Taoist foundations, all that always starts from the seat of channeling. And so the highest ascended point of awareness is direct source from a spiritual new age uh, word sense of the word someone would call it my version with my relationship with Latsu and the 171 other teachers immortals that I access information from someone may call that the Akashic records however you want to see it the validation is in this present moment it's all gobbledygook until you can actually show self-evidence I'm a skeptical guy I don't play with uh, you know talking heads that just ramble i want to see it show me that you're you know you can access this state of consciousness that you're 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 teaching people a high ascended um knowing from an intuitive level of clear sense that's what i want to see and it should be it should be available to everyone because we have the same basic fundamental makeup and so yeah. now you just need to know how to do it that's where the Taoists are second to none. And a lot of the stuff, anything that's been released on the Western side of the world is quite frankly gobbledygook and fragmented.
And, you know, I've had people on the channel recently, uh, uh, a friend of the channel, David Verdesi, who spent 30 years pursuing masters in the jungles of Indonesia across the Eastern Plains, cultivating these internal alchemy practices. And in some cases, we crossed paths because he had a teacher that I came across who was working for the same very powerful Asian family that controlled Indonesia, and it just all comes down to healing. And so the reference of that particular guy was he was one of the very few people to be able to transmit heat and set things on fire from the core connection of that fire element within his physical body. Now, I've never really wasted my time on leveling up to that type of telekinesis. I just prefer witnessing physical flesh fuse back to a default before my very eyes. I'm okay with that. I'm not so in tune with wanting the wonderment of levitating or other things. Now, I, I do take a lot of satisfaction and value in the clear senses because you can read people instantly and get right down to the get down when it comes to healing, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. These are skills that I think everyone should have, and they do have. They just have to be attuned to that. So the, the levitating never really you know, got me all warm and fuzzy. I only know two people in my lifetime that I've witnessed that can do that. And they had a, a very in-depth internal alchemy practice that was reflective of, of Kundalini. And so I just, you know, it's never been my bag. I don't really care about it. And so, you know, telekinesis, moving energy, making people feel energy. These are things that are just fundamental skills that you develop manifestation magic healing the healing part i find really effective because it it changes someone's awareness instantly they see something that they believe is superhuman and they go I, you got my attention oh yeah yeah absolutely 100 percent. but it's a transmutation if you've ever been in a place where you have you ever be, bent metal before bent metal. metal yeah yeah i mean with my hands yeah okay so there's the entry level, right? Where you find the tact the tact tactile experience of the metal against your flesh. Mm -hmm. You put your attention, intention to the center point, and you will shift into the state of now, which is a resonance beyond this electromagnetic spectrum, and the metal will bend bend like a stick of butter. Then the next level of advancement is holding a spoon, melting it like a candle, and then finally you get a fork. And I call it the graduating moment where you move the prongs in either direction with your attention intention. The amount of energy that you channel from that resonance comes out through from the by way out through the spirit, the Shen, and you're using your eyes because there isn't just a third eye within Taoism. and we have nine eyes, which is a whole nother ball game, a whole nother. We go down that rabbit hole. But when you're focusing your attention intention, things instantly become materialized when you're in that state of the now. Mm -hmm. So have you, did you mend, did you bend it uh, with the intention to bend it with your mind or you're just. Oh, bend? just right. <laughs> and so that the, uh, the reason I bring that up is because it's very similar, if not the same as healing physical flesh. And you'll see that flesh transmutate before your very eyes and come back to its original state, whatever the, the disturbance, the dukkha is, it will be realized because you hold that resonance. But most healers take it from their life force. So they literally, for for sh for pennies on the dollar, are sacrificing their constitution, their jing, for a miracle that they never had to be a part of because what happened is they fire up their energetics and then they they believe they are the Messiah. They are the next coming of Jesus. They are the the, the healing tool. In actuality, to be the now means that there is no title, place, person, or thing. And that is how you, you become the catalyst to a healing, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. And it's now, and it has nothing to do with you. So, of course, why would you be tapping into your life force if you are able to access this present moment? You wouldn't. So most healers are full subject to that um, misconception, that uh, uh, misdirection. It's a, it's, it's unfortunately broken dreams that a myriad of broken dreams when people realize 
holy crap, I've literally handed off my life force. Uh, yes, now if you access Dallas Alchemy, you can level up that battery. So when someone comes into this world, they get a battery, a battery is 100%. I've never seen someone come in at 100%. Their hereditary genetic disposition, how they were they were con crafted and conceived from their ancestors is self-evident in, in their physical expression. Now that is normally people come in with a constant, we call the jing, the constitution. And it's normally about 80% of their 100% realized potential. It's just like getting a cell phone and you go, oh, I've got to charge it up. They didn't fully charge the cell phone. That's how people enter into this realm. And so a Taoist practice is, is you take the 80%, take it to 100%. Now from the 100%, you take it to 1,000%. From 1,000, you take it up to 9,000%. Now that is the enrichment of what someone would perceive on a high level as a breatharian, where we are using every element at will and we're nourishing this 50 trillion cells as potential of what your attention intention is. But there must be a very palpable existence of this, in, this internal architecture, and that comes from the cultivation. Once you have it, it never leaves you. It's just like this. And it only gets stronger as you continue your path and your realization. But most healers get caught up in, I am the Messiah. I am the next coming of Jesus. And it's like, I, I have no attachment. That's why I do what they call, uh, I take my kids down to the strip. Sometimes we'll go down and do street magic. It's always fun. To and what is that into? How do you do that? Well, street magic is, is kind of an interesting one. It's for entertainment purposes only. But mm -hmm. I offer people a few things. So I've taught all my kids how to hypnotize and do all this kind of stuff. So we'll start with a group of people. People are in Vegas. It's the town to party, baby. So right. you get in front of a group and you say, have, have you ever experienced bliss, complete bliss and joy, like in a second? And they're like, no. I said, would you like to? Yes. And so their friends position themselves with a the camera because this particular person is the focus of everyone's attention. And in the same second that I say that, I go, sleep. And then their friends pass out standing up and their friends are like, oh, what just happened? And I'm like, okay, now let's take it a little deeper. Let's erase their name, take their wallet and keys. And when they wake up, I'm Justin Bieber. And they're like, this is crazy. You were just talking to him a second ago. I was under the impression that you do this thing where look into my eyes, watch the pendulum. No, 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 no. no. People don't understand. I'm, I bring the resonance with me. I alter the rippling effects of what is present right now. And I reset it back to the present moment as now and to do that nothing and so all of a sudden they wake up and you're waving their keys and wallet in front of them it's all entertainment purposes their friends are watching their video tapping it and i'm like have you lost something you know what where is my wallet and keys can you find do you see them and their friends are like <laughs> i'm like by the way what what is your name and they're like And their friends are freaking out. And that same second, and they go, Justin Bieber. Now, I look nothing like Justin Bieber. Now, understanding that these are states of consciousness, and that's just entry-level hypnosis. That's just like, hey, another day, a run in the, a run in the uh, park, a walk in the, the, the city, however you want to stroll. This is just a state of consciousness that anyone can enter at any time. Mm -hmm. And for all uh, intensive purposes, when people realize this, they can start taking charge of their reality. And so I use that for entertainment purposes. And it's a lot of fun because people instantly come out of this knowing so high as a kite that they'd never thought they could feel so good as if they're floating on air, as if they'd spent... 10 hours in some deep meditation to find the realization of the meaning of life. And they're like, how the hell is that possible? It's just this present moment. And so that's what I call street magic. Mm -hmm. plus, you know, silly things where, you know, you want to play, pick a card, any card, find the number. Yes. And, you know, I do some of that stuff too, just for fun, because I always pursue 
I have a bad reputation with mentalists and illusionists. They don't like me because mm. I can explain how their psychological tricks work and then show them something that goes beyond what they think is just a trick mm. and it's actually real. And that's a little problematic in most cases. They're a little, you know. I guess you've got a lot of that out there in Vegas. You've got a lot of illusionists and magicians and a yeah. lot of interesting energies in that city. I know. Well, they don't, they don't believe it. They don't believe the stuff that they trick people with. Mm, but there's also, they use things where they use sleight of hand to perform or exhibit what they call a PK touch, a psychic a kinetic sort of response. And mm -hmm. so when you don't understand that that's very real when you connect people's auras and that we're really all connected, that you don't have to be a charlatan to exhibit these type of potentials. You can actually mm -hmm. do it. Well, where did you learn? Where did you learn your magic? I mean, I, you didn't go to China. It sounds like you did go yeah, to China. Yeah, that's yeah. I went to China. Like I'm ordained in two lineages. One's a 66 generation holder. The other one's a 126 generation holder. Mm -hmm. And that particular lineage was uh, deep into exorcisms, and uh, it was commandeered and basically channeled from uh, Jean Darling, who was the founder of that monastery, and he went into great. Um, great sort of like deep um, conference with uh, Latsu, who's my teacher to this day. But I started channeling instantaneously, realizing who I was like 30 years ago. The, the, the teacher that taught me had 60 years in the game in his natural born life mm -hmm. and was extremely disappointed that I walked in in five seconds and realized who I was from a thousand lives before this. And the transmission was so palpable that everyone in the in the class was taking out their sticks with marshmallows at the end of them cooking because that's what happens when you bring that transmission. Now, old school channeling is that direct source. How do you know this? I'll take my hand and light a flame under it when I'm channeling Latsu like 100%, not mediumship, but bringing his essence within my physicality. It will not have any effect on my, my physical flesh because you're taking a resonance that is embedding and in, in, in basically moving through everything at a subatomic particle. It's not of this of this spectrum. That means that it is pure. That means that it will have zero effect in what is a 3D reality. You will have zero effect on that resonance. That resonance will reset everything to the default, which is perfection. And so within channeling old school, this goes for the friend of the channel, David Vadesi, you would check you he he was old school like when we channel like not today when someone you know 30 years ago when someone would come to me with a psychotic episode they would potentially be submitted uh admitted to some type of psychic ward a psych ward for evaluation and then we would go deep into an sort of an exorcism or other spirit entity sort of like realization today that same person wouldn't even come to me that have an epiphany, that watch a YouTube video. Next minute, I'm channeling the Palladians that open up a YouTube channel and probably have 100,000 followers in a week. This mm -hmm. is what happens in today's society. But the difference is, is the resonance. The resonance is here. The resonance is real. And guess what? When you go on Yelp, there are 500 healers, 500 channelers, 500 mystics, 500 whatever, mediums, whatever. They're real. They're bringing real conscious. They're bringing the now. It's not a figment of their imagination. And that's sort of self-evident from a lot of the prophecies of what's taking place in this year and next year. And it's self-evident within the Schumann resonance. A friend of my channel, Alexis from Ascension Diaries, she talks about, because she reads the Schumann resonance, about how the electromagnetic uh, uh, transmission, which is about a 7.83 for hertz frequency of the earth which runs in about a sort of a, a an alpha theta state that you're in and so when you get past that of uh, that brain wave because your brain wave is literally attuning to the brain wave of the earth and you're subjected to your personality but generally if you just allow it you will express it through the the resonance of the earth because this is the earth, you're a micro of macro. And so what happens is someone is artificially altering that brainwave, that wave, that resonance, and she's seeing evidence of it going up to a 12, an 18. 
Now, for anyone who doesn't know what that means, that means that you're going into beta, high beta, high anxiety. Someone is artificially altering that wave. And then she's seeing a lot of evidence of the resonance going up into the 40, 50, 60 hertz, which would be representative of a high gamma, which means 100% conscious, meaning you're accessing all the brain waves at once. So that is the polarizing or the self-evident effects of that resonance of Earth, and that's coming, leading into this, the rest of this year and next year, which would then be reflective of all the prophets talking about, oh my goodness, it's a level of consciousness, it's the year of truth, and you know, I, at the beginning of the year, people were coming to Latsu asking him this question, and when I channeled, and I channel him all the time, but you know, for for entertainment purposes, I'll channel him, and his answers are really funny. He's a, he's a quite a character. He's like. You are like a grain of sand. Imagine this. You are a grain of sand asking the beach, what are we doing today? <laughs> Fall back into the beach and be realized. And I was just like, you can't make this stuff up. I was just like, holy yeah. moly. It's like crazy. But, you know, this is what happens when you tap into pure source. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm not, I don't ever lay claim that I know anything. I know nothing. When that happens, I can access this information and be the, the conduit to have other people realize and remember who they are. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. It's a lot. Yeah, you're 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 taking it. You're taking it. You're taking it in chunks. It's uh, it's intriguing, curious, and then uh, maybe too much. <laughs> Good. So I guess that's sort of like a how the different systems kind of work in retrospect looking yeah at and so yeah. within my buddhist monk friends they're not big into the alchemy they couldn't care less they're about the distortion and they just want to be still they want to know what that's like mm. yeah um, yeah or make the it gets real simple in, in my particular lineage or, or buddhism in general it's about the cessation of suffering and that, I mean, that's where the fundamental difference between Taoism and Buddhism, everyone goes, oh, it's just an Eastern philosophy. It's the same. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, right. Well, for me, I explain it this way. A Buddhist is like looking at life like a pile of dirt covered in diamonds. You pull off another mm -hmm. diamond looking for more dirt. This, it, this extended journey to find all the dirt, all mm -hmm. the dukkha, as much as possible, whereas a, a Taoist looks at life like this. It's a pile of diamonds covered in dirt. I just dust mm -hmm. off another another mm. dust off some more dirt and find another diamond. And when someone asks me, how are you doing today? I go, it's good to be me. Interesting. I would say that the Buddhists would say that the dirt is the diamond. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. A fundamental difference, maybe. We're just looking right. at it wrong. And that's the right. dukkha, is the suffering. Right. right, right. The dukkha is the suffering. And, you know, from a dear friend of the channel, Tom Campbell, who's a conscious explorer of out-of-body experiences. He had a relationship with the Bob Monroe Institute, if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. They were just basically working on programs, uh, creating, uh, you know, programs for uh, three-letter agencies that will remain nameless, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That was the exploration of realizing that human beings have access to this higher state of awareness, and from that bearing the fruit of, you know, things like, you know, um, men staring at goats and other projects that would be reflective of human history, indicating that people are aware there's something greater out there, yet they don't want to share it with you, but they want access to it. And so you get down those paths. But anyway, Tom would call it the large consciousness system is giving you what you want. It's what he calls the my big toe, my theory of everything, my big theory, my big toe, my big theory of everything is that it's all a simulation mm. and that you alter the probabilities of potential from your attention intention that changes the fabric of mm. the now. Of the, of the simulation. Yeah. yeah. Simulation and the sort of the um, sense that it's being used now. Uh, who is that guy that wrote super intelligence? Nick Bostrom. Some people talk about, you know, they're in the tech community. They talk about possibly were a simulation from some future video game that some kid is playing in another dimension. In that uh, sense, a simulation? Yeah, yeah, it's like a holographic, yeah, the holographic. holographic theory, right? Right, right, right. right. You know, 
you would go back to something a little bit more ominous that Bob Monroe would refer to as the louche. The louche is an, an energy that just sucks from the very teat of humanity and the collective energy is being drawn from it. So the more you feed into your emotions, the more the louche is satisfied, the more you are separated from your true self. And that is evident by your exhaustion and your disdain for the now, your disdain for your human condition. And this is sort of fundamentally what we would call the glass hem glass half empty or half full, which would be reflective of perhaps maybe just how you look at things, which is really the now. Mm. Is it half empty or half full? How do you see it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. This is um this is an interesting conversation, my friend. <laughs> it is. Very, very interesting. I feel like I, I spent a little bit more time uh uh, speaking than you did but uh, then again <laughs> when it comes down to the foundation of what you speak of you're talking about the simplicity of the now that has nothing to do with intricate sort of details that i'm sort of raveling off that are for for all intensive purposes within your journey are unnecessary so that's what i value about conversations like this that yeah, it's, too, it's, powerful. Too. it's powerful because there's no right or wrong way up the mountain right and yeah very different approaches and very very different expressions and um, different insights, but one, one, one uh, destination. Right, right. And the, the des destination is really, really knowing, remembering who you are, mm -hmm. and being that night yeah, right now. True face, they call it in the Rinzai lineage. True face or true self. Mm. The ordinary mind is no mind, is what the uh, 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 Rinzai, the founder of my lineage, calls it. Wow. So I guess if we wrap this conversation up, I'm going to ask you one last question. First and foremost, I want to tell everyone, the audience, I want them to go out and find your YouTube channel, find your social media. That will all be below this podcast. And, um, and go and seek uh, services. Uh, look into your training, your 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 methods and start experiencing that. I want the OGs, I want my students, everyone watching this channel to go out and take a look, example, go deep diving through your YouTube channel, through your uh, offerings, is it through a website? What is it that you normally offer to people as a path of uh, realization? No, I mean, I've got my YouTube channel Zen Confidential and uh i've got essays and more blogs and sometimes we do uh sunday zazen meditation sits on my patreon page which is patreon.com slash shozan jack so those are the two things primarily right now that i'm putting out there nice excellent and so in closing i would ask you one question my friend what is your definition of consciousness Definition of consciousness. God, oh, that's funny because I've been having this conversation with my girlfriend and a friend of mine who's a Zen priest out here for uh, seven years now. And uh, I don't know if I have a definition of consciousness, actually. Um, I mean, it's a word that people have used to describe what goes on inside the head or the connection between the head in the outer circumstances. Um, so maybe I'll come back at you with a question. What do you mean by consciousness? Well, that's that's the in the eyes of the beholder. For me, um, to be more clear, spiritual consciousness, which is the sum of all things, not separating yourself from a conscious agent, which would be a, a, a sort of a mind control or a psyop that comes from other directions that are more realm of man-like. But spiritual consciousness is uh, realizing or being aware you have choices. Hmm. So it's a, so it's a state of it's a it's a state of it's mind. Being, yeah, being, well, not a state of mind. Moreover, just a state, a realization of the now. Mm. I guess when I think of when I when I, I don't use the word consciousness too much, um, I, but I but maybe an analogous idea or, or or teaching in in Buddhism and Zen would be the sati, which is a Sanskrit word, which just means 
present moment awareness. Right? Yeah. So, so uh, awareness. So oftentimes I'm lost in my head and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just lost in my head and I'm not seeing what's right in front of me. I'm not looking at you and that beautiful dragon behind you. I've got some script that's running through my head. So the practice of sati manifesting present moment awareness is, is probably the closest analogous thing to, to consciousness. We, like we talked a little bit about a little bit earlier, the word, Maybe I don't remember if it was the word consciousness we were talking about, but but that is a word that's starting to get a number of different meanings across a number of different disciplines, from maybe Taoism all the way over to neurology, all the way over over to different Buddhist practices. So I'm not quite sure what to do with that word, but I do think of the again and again and again. I think of present moment awareness, really awareness for me getting out of my head, paying attention to what's going on in front of me and what's going on inside of me. Attention and awareness. <laughs> Amen to that, brother. Amen to that. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on the channel. I'm really grateful to that you came and spent some time with us. Um, a beautiful insight to the very practices and the, the method of your own journey uh, to the now. And... Uh, I want to thank you for coming on today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been totally fascinating for me. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the universe for bringing you into my life. I want to thank the audience for sharing their time with us. And I am your humble servant and Sifu Taoist Master Sun Ching. And I'll see you on the next one, guys.